<laughs> Welcome, and I um, appreciate if folks can grab a seat. Okay. Well, this will be a lot of fun. So this is uh, where the theme today is security in the boardroom. You two guys are living this every day on the front line. You're operating executives. You're on multiple boards as board chairman and board directors. So what we want to do today is get your perspective on the reality of this stuff, because you're living it, and also some of the perspectives on the points raised earlier. Um, got a couple questions here that we've talked earlier. Probably going to go off script a little bit. Um, and then we definitely want to leave some room for some questions from the folks in the audience. Okay, so uh, get them teed up and we'll leave some room at the end. Um, Steve, I want to start with you. Um, a lot of people may not know Ivanti. It's a new name, but it's a company that's been around a heck of a long time. And I think the journey um, that you've led, you've been there quite a while, is a real interesting one. So maybe you could paint the picture on that and then we'll get off and running. Sure. So um, Ivanti, actually, Ivanti, the name came about the beginning of this year. Um, we were, our DNA goes back to uh, Landesk was, was really the company. Uh, it was part, it actually started as a company called Land Systems, which was acquired by Intel back in the early 90s. Uh, and, and so, and the Landesk division was formed at that time. And really the the, the impetus behind it was uh, Intel at the time, this, you know, this was the early 90s, microprocessors were really starting to take off, uh, and Intel recognized that the cost of owning uh, a, a desktop was a lot higher than it was for a, um, a mainframe or a mini environment, and so the total, reducing the total cost of owning one of these distributed assets was really the goal of Landesk at the time. Uh, and so uh, went through a number of iterations and, and kind of in the 2002 time frame when Intel had diversified, it was doing data centers, was doing a bunch of things and then decided to get back to the core and focus on silicon, uh, spun out a lot of the, the businesses and, and Landesk was one of those businesses that spun out. Uh, and so Landesk spun out in 2002 uh, and, and, and instead of being an enabler and a reduce of, of cost, it now became a profit motive and the company uh, pivoted, that was, that was kind of the first pivot of the company, and we, what we started to recognize was there was a convergence happening of, of systems and security management. Um, and, and we noticed it really in the patching area, which at the time, in the early 2000s, was really a security function, uh, and, but, but started to become more and more um, done by the IT ops people. And, and that's our traditional customer base was IT ops. And so uh, we started, we came out with the first integrated patch suite into a, a desktop systems management suite. Uh, we've since uh, pivoted multiple times uh, and, and added to that technology to the point where now our, what we recognize is that when it comes to end user computing, the way that IT is managing and securing end user devices uh, is, is what we believe is fundamentally a flawed model right now. Because of the way that it's, it's, um, it's evolved, we have, we're very siloed in the way, way, way we, we, we manage and secure us. And so, so for, for instance, you know, there's a team that's the IT operations, desktop operations team. If I'm, if I'm trying to do my work from a desktop, there's a, a mobile team that's trying to keep me up and running and secure if I'm on my mobile device. There's a security team that has a remit to secure me. There's a service delivery team. There's a, there's a service support team and they're all siloed. And it creates a model in our mind that's one, very costly because IT has to somehow figure out how to stitch all the technologies and all the communication pathways together. But it's also becomes very risky. Uh, because there's so many handoffs and so many people doing things that others don't know. And so, so our, our vision is to unify IT, when it come, particularly when it comes to end user computing, and bring together <laughs> the technologies, bring together the teams in a way um, that, we, that we get a 360 degree view of what the end user is trying to do. Uh, and that's really with, uh, we, we, we went through an acquisition, um, we've done a number of acquisitions, but we went through an acquisition at the beginning of the year uh, new investor. They merged us with a company called Heat Software, which had, has some very robust service management technologies. Uh, and that's when we renamed the company to Avanti. Uh, so beginning of the year. That's great. I want to come back to a couple of the themes on that in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Now at break, I was always at work. You may have thought that I was socializing out there. I was getting questions from the audience. So we have some real time feedback. And so Michael, one of the questions for you, this is you know, fresh, right off the hit is, ask him about Trump. Ask him about Trump. <laughs> so, uh, 
Can so, I answer okay. that one? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, from a security perspective for the, this community, the Silicon Valley community, what do we make of this? What are the dangers, concerns? What are the real opportunities here with, the, with this administration? <clears throat> that was a long conversation. I thought actually you were going to tell us you were going to rename the company Ivanka. That, one, <laughs> that would really get yeah. you penetration into the government yeah. marketplace. Um, Steve, Steve Morton's yeah. taking a note on that. <laughs> um, uh, look, I think uh, <clears throat> I mean, there's a lot of different things you can say. Uh, you know, from the standpoint of cybersecurity, uh, you know, the, the uh, administration did issue an executive order. There are folks uh, in the White House and a DHS who actually are pretty experienced in cybersecurity. And there has been a discussion about moving to have getting the federal government into the cloud and upgrading the general level of security. That's good policy. It's a good strategy. I've heard that song before. It's easy to play the music. It's really hard to actually make it happen. So the real key question is going to be, is there going to be implementation? Will the people who will have the actual operational authority uh, in terms of budget, in terms of actually making the purchasing, uh, and in terms of actually implementing, will they bring together, have a unified theory of how they want to migrate everybody to the cloud? Will they be able to acquire the right technologies? Will they unify the purchasing? There are some positive possibilities because <clears throat> I do think this administration is willing to be a little more outside the mold in terms of traditional procurement and in terms of wanting to promote innovation. On the other hand, they get, shall we say, easily distracted at the top. <laughs> um, I don't know if you, any of you if you have dogs. We have a Jack Russell Terrier. With a Jack Russell Terrier, a, a great dog, if you take a dog out and there's something the dog's supposed to do and there's like a squirrel or something else, forget it. The dog is going for the squirrel. So you get a little bit of that at the top um, exhibit A being the event in Phoenix yesterday. Um, so that's going to be the real question, I think, from a security standpoint. Is there going to be a, um, f a focus on actually implementing the strategy, or is it going to wind up getting lost in a, in a, a kind of a smokescreen of distractions and irrelevancies? And I think we'll have to see. The other thing I would say is this, I think, in general, both in the cyber and the physical realm, we are going to see an uptick in security threats. There is a lot of anger globally now. We can get into a you know, chicken and egg issue about how that got started. I think it was latent for a long period of time. And I think what we've seen electorally in the US, but also, frankly, in Europe right. and in other parts of the world, has been a manifestation of that. Uh, whether it's the Philippines, where the, the president runs around boasting how he's a murderer, or some of what we're seeing in, in, in other parts of the world. And I think what that's going to be reflecting is more physical violence and acting out. We saw it in Charlottesville with that guy with the car. We we've, we've saw it in, in Barcelona. I think you're going to see it online, too. Some of these folks are going to go online and carry out these, these attacks. And that's separate from nation state things. So for those who are in the security space, I actually think it's, we have to get our game up better and there's really going to be an appetite and a need for strategic development of new security tools. Hmm. Are there any tools or any areas in particular that you think will be relatively ascending more quickly? And even, even beyond cyber, I mean, other yeah. types of security risks? Uh, machine intelligence, uh, we're collecting more and more data. How do you make use of it? Hmm. And how do you do it in a way that allows you to uh, not, you know, so slow up the way we move people through the airport or through the border, that it becomes a nightmare. So I think that's going to be a, mm. a, big, a big area. I think in general, any kind of physical screening, I mean, we're dealing with more sophisticated bombs. We had that laptop issue that came up a couple months ago with, with airplanes. We've got to get our game up with respect to, to that as well. I think identity continues to be a critical issue. And also, I, I'd go further and say, you know, one of the issues I've observed um, in Europe, if you look at the, at the terrorist attacks there, one of the failings has been not that they didn't know there was someone out there who was potentially problematic, but there were too many of them. And they couldn't figure out what to do, how to track them. And actually, there are technology, te technologies and technological opportunities that would say that once you have identified a person of interest, you can do a focused effort to track what they are doing online and in the physical world so if they begin to look like they're moving from being you know, potential to actually operational, you could intervene and do that. 
And I think that's a real area for, uh, for technological development. Listen, I'd love to follow up on that, but I want to go back, Steve, to build on what you said on your intro about the, the journey of the company. And I think you were kind of humble on the role that M&A is actually part of your strategy. That's hard to do, and it's really hard to do the integrations and make it right. Can you talk about what you and your team have done to sort of make that happen, and then how you've also sort of woven security uh, into that mix of growing the business. Yeah, sure. So, so a a absolutely, um, acquisition has been part of that strategy. Uh, we've uh, we've done ten acquisitions in the last five years, uh, pulling together pieces of the technology. I think, I think the thing that that um, so I you know I grew up, I started my career at Intel. And um, to be honest, Intel, we sucked at doing acquisitions. You know, I, there were a number of them that I was involved with specifically, uh, either brought in, you know, towards, towards the end when, we, when all of the founders had left and, and, and they were trying to figure out what do we do with this um, or, or, um, or to close it down just because we had lost all the kind of intellectual capital. So I think that one of the key things is just to recognize that, you know, when it comes to technology, particularly when you're talking about software, um, you know, it, you, you come up with a very innovative idea. You can protect it with, with patents. It takes you five, six years to get one issued, you know, and, but, and in that time frame, two people in a garage somewhere around the world can copy what you did uh, once they see that kind of innovative idea. And, and so really what, what you're buying when you buy a software company is you're buying the people, you're buying that intellectual capital, you're buying the expertise in the, in the space. For us, it's always about are, are we getting some DNA into the company that we don't have already, uh, some expertise in an area of the market that's, that's new for us, uh, and, and, then, and then doing everything we can to try to keep that, keep that talent uh, on board. Um, the, other, the other piece uh, of it is um, it, it takes a lot of discipline to do, to do acquisition. So you have to have a pretty good idea strategically where you want to go. The reality is um, unless you're going to way overpay, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to find. It's hard to say I've got a, I've got a hole right here in my roadmap. I'm going to go fill it with an acquisition because you've got to find somebody that wants to dance at the same time you want to dance. Uh, unless you're just going to throw stupid money at it. And, and we do a pretty good job of buying companies out of companies that have paid stupid money for acquisitions and, and carving them back out. Because when you do that, it, it sets you up for, uh, it sets up expectations and, and, and it sets you in a position where most likely you're going to fail. Uh, and so being very disciplined about, um, you know, what you're going to pay for the company, what, what you're really getting, how the strategic fit um, when you, when you buy companies that are overlap a lot with products that you already have, it's really, really, really hard. Uh, it's really hard to rationalize. And so uh, we prefer to buy uh, any acquisition, even if there is some overlap, there has to be new technologies. There have yeah. to be new products, new customer set, customers uh, that we bring in as part of that, uh, part of that process. And then it, it's, a, it's a team sport. I've seen a lot of companies that treat it as they have an M&A team, uh, the, the biz dev guys get involved. Um, we, we involve the entire executive team in the process early on uh, and make sure that there's a, a, a complete fit across the business and that, and that we're not handing the sales leaders, you know, something that they, that they, after the fact and saying, okay, go figure out how it fits together. And so I think in involving a broader team early on in that process um, it increases the chances of, of success. I want to kind of build on that because we're talking about security as a risk, security as a business opportunity. Both of you guys are on multiple boards as chairman of the board and board members. And um, some of the research that we did said board members learn from other board members. I would love to have you as the security guy on our board. That would be great, right? So I'd love to ask you, Michael, how have you seen the security conversation change in the boards and in particular, how are the queries to you changing? I think that would be really interesting to see what are fellow board members asking you. So I, will, I just to, you know, kind of, I'm a little bit unusual in this sense. Most of the boards I'm on are security companies. I work with boards that are not, which are a broader set in the financial services area, in the energy area, et cetera. In the security area, if you're in the defense business, I'm chairman of BAE Systems, Inc. in the U.S., that's your bread and butter. So the people who on our board are former head of, former uh, director of NSA, former chief of naval operations. So these are not unsophisticated right. people. Yeah. Um, but I think even, even bearing that in mind over time, I think obviously there's been a greater focus <clears throat> on this. Mm -hmm. And 
we spent a lot of time thinking about, um, you know, our, our security and our risk in general, but in particular cybersecurity, particularly because if you do work with the government, that's part of your license to do business. Uh, you know, the, the federal acquisition regulations do require increasingly that you be able to demonstrate that you and your subs are, you know, uh, reasonably secure. And actually, that's a, a really interesting emerging issue because yeah. more and more, it's not just your own security, but those of your subs and the people who are connecting to you that you own too, and you have to be able to certify. So how do you do that in a way that's efficient, um, I think is becoming, is, is certainly a topic of conversation at the boards I'm on. That's actually one of the boards that I'm on. That was um, an issue we had to deal with. It mm -hmm. came in from the sales team, mm -hmm. and it said, hey, we're getting asked to do all these paperwork and forms. What the heck do we do? We're doing it one off. And it led to uh, a number of changes mm -hmm. in process improvements. Hey, Steve, you're on multiple boards yourself. What about your perspective on the same question? Yeah, and so my, um, I sit on boards, and, and, and I've been you know, CEOs private companies, and so, and I've never been on a board or, or ran a company that's been in a super highly regulated industry, right? I haven't been in financial services, FinTech, or, or those types of things. Um, we're starting to see exactly what uh, Secretary Chertoff talked about in, in that, in the sales engagement, um, we have to, and it's not just FedGov, you know, DOD, yeah. it's, it's across the board, we're getting asked more and more, you know, show us what, show <coughs> us why, you know, show us that you're secure. And so that there's not a risk with your technology. Uh, I, I, you know, I would say my experience is that um, it's a very under underappreciated um, discipline at the board level. Uh, I, you know, most of most of the boards that I sit on, we don't we don't have regular conversations about it, uh, to be honest. And and um, and I think I think as a CEO, uh, if if um, you know, from my perspective, uh, if if you wait for the board to ask you to do this, then you're way too late because the board's never going to ask you until you have you have an incident uh, or something that really puts the company at risk. Because the reality is, um, the reality is, people I think have become numb to the idea that you mm -hmm. know everybody it, everybody who throws around it's not if you're going to get breached, it's when, right? And so yeah. there's just this assumption that there's going to be a breach. Uh, you don't hear a lot about it unless it's a target or it's, yeah. a, it's one of the big ones yep. you don't, because nobody wants to talk about it. Uh, nobody wants to go public and say, oh, we had a breach, right? And so, so I don't think the awareness of what the real risks are associated with it, and I think we get numb to the fact that, that we hear about these things happening all the time and everybody gets breached. You just have to normal course of business type of stuff. So, um, so I, think, uh, I think it really falls on the CEO to make it a priority. Because I don't think the board's ever going to force companies to do this, at least not in the near term. I haven't seen it happen. I'll tell you three areas, though, which I would I, I think are interesting to think a little bit about. One is I do think um, I have seen boards raise the question and companies raise the question when they penetrate into certain marketplaces. Like if you're going yeah. to China, you mm -hmm. get questions about what do I do there. If you're going to Africa where the infrastructure is not particularly secure, you get questions about that. So that is one area. Less frequently, but occasionally, we have also heard from boards where they're entering a new line of business. If you're in financial services and you're going to do a lot more online, you know, we did a session with a global bank, and uh, they were got very interested once we kind of raised the issue for them about are we really changing our surface area in terms of attacks? Um, or there was another bank, a global bank, we did an exercise with, and. What emerged was that they were really not prepared with a plan B. If something went down, how would they service the sure. transactions they had to service for important customers? So you do get some of that, mm -hmm. which, which I do think is, um, is a positive side. I think the biggest problems you have with boards, honestly, is partly what you say. You get numb to it. But it's partly they get besieged with so many different problems and products they throw their hands in the air and they go, I can't figure it out. I'm just going to pray that I'm lucky. Yeah. And um, the, the, what, what I find that we wind up doing most of the time is like what an architect does when you're renovating a house. You could go out yourself and you could buy, you know, hire your plumber, hire your electric. You're never going to know how it fits together. What the architect should do is sit down with you and say, what do you want? What's important to you in the house? And then with that, design the house and help you figure out what are the contractors you need to do the actual work. 
So to me, it, when I talk to boards, the biggest thing I try to do is empower them, to tell them it's not hopeless, have a reasonable set of expectations. Uh, if you do, there's a disciplined way to manage through the process, to hold people accountable, and then you can have confidence, not that you'll never have a problem, but you'll have confidence that you'll be able to manage the problem and come back and be resilient. That, those are some great points. And Steve, let me just kind of build on what uh, Michael was just saying in terms of building the program for the company. I know you guys at Ivanti have been through that the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. Tell us about maybe some of the highlights or lessons learned in uh, your own internal journey of building your security risk program. Yeah, so, so from, from my perspective, lessons learned is I should have taken this seriously a lot earlier. Uh, mm -hmm. frankly. Uh, and um, um, we, it, it's only been over the last couple of years that we've really gotten serious about the, about the program. And, and I know when we, when we hired our, our first CISO, um, excellent, I mean, it was one of, the, one of the best hires we've made. Uh, and he went out and did his risk assessment, uh, did, did some, you know, started some of these um, phishing um, campaigns just to test how people did. And we just, I mean, we're horrible. I mean, we were, we were, people, like a quarter of the people were clicking through on these, I mean, worse than, worse than the general public uh, sort of things. <laughs> and, and so, um, you know, and, and that's when it really, really started to worry me that, man, we've got a lot bigger risk here than we, than I ever thought we, we possibly had. Um, and, but, but the great thing is, um, over the last two years, those have come in the low single digit click through rates. And again, it, it's just because we put the investment, we put the focus uh, into that. So um, I think I think it's something that, it, you know, my advice to anybody that doesn't have one is get one um, and, 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 and figure out how to fund that because it doesn't take a lot of funding, but it can have a really high impact on, on the, the security posture of the um, of the company uh, to, to do that. And, and it's been it's been great. Now, uh, you know, one of the things uh, one of the things I liked in one of the earlier panels was talking about how do you talk as a CISO and, and how do you how do you make yourself relevant? Right. So I think another part of the problem when when coming to talk to the board, I don't spend a lot of time in board meetings talking about financial risk and governance. Right. The audit committee kind of handles that. We don't spend we, we spend zero time in board meetings actually talking about that stuff. Mm. Um, what we talk about is things that are going to drive the business. How's the business doing? How's the business, um, uh, you know, what, what's going what's to improve our business? And, and what our CISO has done very well, Phil, and I think, he, I think he was here last night, a lot of you probably met him, was he's gotten involved with us in, in the sales processes. He's been a resource for us to help show the customers, uh, our potential customers, that one, we're serious about this. We've got an expert, a guy that can speak the language, that you know, gives them a lot of confidence about our, our posture and, and, and our investment in it, as well as uh, he helps us in the, in the sales process as far as you know, buy this product, but this is how I use it in, internally. This is, how I, uh, this is how I see you can use it. You know, he's got so much domain expertise. And, and when, when, when the, the, I think IT has a problem in general with this, uh, we get viewed as a, as a cost center because we don't really connect how we can help the business grow and, and be more successful. We just kind of talk about risk, where we're so focused on risk and, and, and mitigating risk that we get relegated to the cost center. And so I think ways to kind of plug into how can I help the business grow, not just be a risk mitigator. Um, um, and that's what that's what yeah. drive uh, the business. That's what that for us that to me, that's what's been probably the is probably the biggest benefit of, of investing in a program. Like what this. follows up what both of you guys were talking about earlier, that you're finding that companies want to go see in their supply chain, yeah. where's my weakest link, who's going to hurt me? So you can kind of get ahead of that and turning it into an advantage. Uh, we have a flash report. Another question has just come in. Um, ask Secretary Chertoff about Silicon Valley tampering in the Russian elections. Okay. What can, Silicon what, Valley camper, what, can, what can we do here? A yeah. lot of the big brands are right in the middle of this, right? No, I know. What can um, we, should we do? So let me say a couple of things. Let's separate out two things. One thing is actually affecting databases, uh, voting machines, databases on voter registration, et cetera. That's one category of issues. The other issue is the so-called fake news issue, putting out things that are inaccurate and driving them up the search engine 
uh, because you use either automated botnets or you have literally pe teams of people sitting in like St. Petersburg who are deliberately clicking on things in order to drive it up. The latter is uh, a complicated set of issues because we want to make sure we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, some people would say, oh, listen, we ought to prevent fake news from being propagated. Germany just passed a law that actually will fine companies pretty substantially if they don't take down hate speech or, in some cases, fake news. Mm. The problem with that, for those of us who believe in the First Amendment, is that's a question of who's, in whose eyes is the news fake. I can guarantee if we had a rule about uh, saying cybersecurity means screening out fake news, number one to go, I'm on board, would be Vladimir Putin. Because the Russians, and mm. I've dealt with them on this, they believe that cyber warfare means stories that they don't want to read online and they don't want to have their citizens read. Now, there are some things that can be done. You can prevent impersonation, uh, someone pretending to be somebody else on a social media. You can, I think, without imperiling the First Amendment, respond to these automated efforts to affect search engines. Uh, it gets a little trickier when you get into some of what we've read recently, which is taking down like white supremacist sites or posts. Mm. Um, you know, I, I might feel some sympathy with that, but again, maybe having been a judge, I get nervous about where the line is on that. So I think there's a set of conversations around that that are, are complicated. On the other issue, though, which is the security of the actual databases themselves, I think there is some work to be done. Um, you know, we've actually been benefited in a way by the widely distributed way in which we do voting in this country. Um, the bad news is it means you have really uneven security depending on the nature of the particular jurisdiction, which is really down to the county or city level. The good news is it's hard to have one kind of problem that affects everybody. And to really affect the election, change the outcome, you would really have to be very um, specific about where to make changes. But here's where I think there's a more realistic danger. Um, the Russians, and I spend a fair amount of time on this in some think tank work I do, have been trying to undermine confidence in democracies f for the last several years. Um, and that's because when the Russians look at what happened in the Ukraine and, and Central Europe, and they see the Orange Revolution and things like that, they see that as a direct threat to their own security. Hmm. So they want to be able to say to the public, you know what, democracy stinks. You don't want that. The West is full of it. And the best way to do that is to undermine the solidarity and the confidence people have in their own institutions. So you wouldn't actually have to affect the election. All you would have to do is create enough doubt about whether the election results were accurate to create a crisis of confidence. They tried to do that, I think, in 2014 in the Ukraine. Um, they didn't actually affect voting machines, but they were trying to affect the media that were reporting on the vote so that the media would falsely report that a fascist had won the presidential election. And even they knew of, that eventually that would be corrected, they thought that would create uncertainty and disorder. So I do think that now focusing on how do you secure voter registration, voting machines, <clears throat> reporting of results is going to become a very, very big topic uh, going forward. Hmm. I want to talk a little bit more about the role of government and get both of you guys a comment on this. This, um, to credit, this came from thehill.com on August 14th. It's a little bit long, so I'm not the best reader in the world. I'll probably stumble as we go through this. Um, as President Kennedy spurred on 1960s America to win the space race, President Trump should direct the US government's computer scientists, technicians, financial experts, in coordination with the private sector to develop a nationwide plan for leading the world in blockchain technology. Russia certainly has a strategy in this race. The US needs to come up with one. So I guess we could start on blockchain, but it's really more of the role of government to help spur innovation and advancements in technology with security in particular. Um, do either one of you guys want to jump into that? Is Should the government be doing more to help us? Yeah, I'm. Um... I'm of kind of two minds on that. I mm. think um, what we've what we've tried to do is partner. Um, we're starting to do some partnerships with some universities and, and those mm. types of things. I think I think um, 
I think if there's a market need for something, I don't know that we need the government to step in and help. Mm. I think I think smart people, you know, and and smart investors are going to figure out how to capitalize on that on that opportunity. Uh, so I think in the case of blockchain, I actually think there's enough, um, you know, there's enough smart people. You know, we've we've been brainstorming about how this applies, you know, to the things as mundane as asset management, right? Interesting. And, and, and I think. And I think that that under, I think there's 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 enough impetus here. There's enough opportunity that I don't know that we need the government to 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 drive it for us. I think I think you've already seen IBM announce a bunch of of, of um, uh, partnerships, even managing the food supply chain. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know that in this specific case. I think there are there are places where it may make sense for government to get involved. But in, in my opinion. Uh, I think we've got enough opportunity that the private sector can r really run with this. Yeah, I think that may be very well be true with <clears throat> your distributed ledgers and blockchain. I do think the government can, however, pr provide a useful spur when they have a, a, a market. I mean, if you look at the development of GPS, if you look at the development of the Onion Router, whether you like it or not, these were driven because there was felt to be a governmental need, and then there was a marketplace mm -hmm. that people mm -hmm. invested in it. Um, I think for the government to play the role effectively, you have to have stability and predictability in what the government's investing in. If every six months we have a financial crisis because you don't know if we're going to have a budget, um, then people kind of throw their hands up and they go, well, we don't want to you know, contract with the government or build a business around the government because you know, we're never going to make our number because you know, there's going to be some weird event and all of a sudden everything's going to shut down. Um, and again, this comes back to the implementation. There's been a lot of talk, and there was talk at the beginning of this administration, oh, we want to spur innovation, we want to use the government to, to drive it. But you know, talk is cheap. Implementation is really hard. Mm. And to implement it, you have to have a process for you know, having a budget, having it be disciplined, passing it, funding it, and then getting the contracts out. That's not rocket science, but it is hard to do because it requires a lot of effort. And our, our government, I, I have to blame Congress as well, has not succeeded in prioritizing this. They'd rather have food fights so they can take, huh. you know, buy ads on TV to accuse the other guy of some kind of, you know, fecklessness, as opposed to saying, how do we do some basic stuff that actually elevates the economy and innovation for everybody? I'm going to do one more question here and then turn it out to the audience. Um, Steve, you're going through a transition to security, a transition to more cloud delivery of products, and maybe both of you guys touch on this. What are some of the regional challenges or the regional opportunities, say, in Asia vis-a-vis -vis Europe or even breaking down different countries as you guys are making those pivots? <coughs> yeah, I mean, we, we run into, um, you know, as an American company, the Patriot Act causes all sorts of, you know, uh, you know, people's heads pop off outside of the U.S. Right? They don't want they don't want their data available to the U.S. government. So, so we we jump through a lot of hoops. Um, I think yeah, I think as a you know as an industry we we're, we're figuring out how to ma to to navigate through those things. Uh, I think. You know, we're, all of them come back to the same. The same. You know, data privacy um, is 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 important uh, to to everybody. And so, so even GDPR. You know, the the yep. in, in Europe, um, it, they're all they're all trying to get to the same thing. So, I, you know, from my perspective, it, it means we have to jump through a lot of hoops. Uh, they're they're very similar hoops, though, and so we can leverage a lot of that a lot of that work um, around the uh, around the world. Uh, and and the reality is by um, by jumping through those hoops, it helps us. It helps us that, that you know yeah. we're viewed as more of a partner than it is than than we are. You know we're, we're se we we become separated from the American part of being an American company by doing that. Uh, Michael, can I ask you the flip side yeah. of that? Thanks, Steve. I think that I mean very very interesting. The flip side of it, foreign companies. Your BAE experience is yeah. incredibly relevant here. Foreign companies who want to invest in the U.S. and particularly invest in security, what are some of the general challenges and the specific challenges with this administration? So I think generally, if you're going to be in a business where you're, you are going to be selling to the U.S. government because it's a security product, you're going to have to deal, in addition to the Committee on Foreign Investment, but you're going to have to deal with issues about can you get classified contracts or do business with the government. That is going to be probably require some kind of a special security agreement, maybe a proxy board. 
increasingly, by the way, what we see in reviewing uh, contracts uh, with the government, if you're a foreign company, is they want to be sure that your supply chain is not compromised. So you have to validate yourself if you're going to do business with the U.S. government. But even if not, more and more, I think what we saw under the prior administration and will continue is a, a um, sensitivity about any kind of investment in security that exposes a foreign-owned company to American data. And the ability to demonstrate that data will not migrate somewhere else is the flip side of what you said, Steve, yeah. is increasingly an issue in dealing with the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S. So um, I think even in the, in, if you're doing commercial work only, there is going to be a security issue and a foreign influence issue that you have to manage. And the right way to do it, and, and we do a fair amount of work in this area, is to think through in advance how you're going to architect yourself to satisfy the objections and not wait until someone raises an objection and now you're trying to backfill. I think under the Trump administration, and it's always a little hard to predict, but I would say that the, um, there'll probably be more emphasis on what I would call uh, economic nationalism, job creation. So if I'm a foreign company and I want to do business in the US, uh, if I'm going to be closing plants in the US, you're going to have a problem. If I can actually make the case I'm going to be investing, creating jobs in the US, I think this administration, some of the economic departments may be actually more interested in promoting mm. that. They may see mm. that as a more positive value. Mm. So that um, I do think there's an opportunity to turn the issue of jobs in the US uh, kind of on its head and make it a positive thing as opposed to, to a negative thing. Mm. You know, to give you an example, when you do business mm. in certain countries overseas, you deal with offsets. Hmm. And if you're going to get a contract, you have to kind of promise to do a certain amount of indigenous work. We may see in many ways the reverse of that in this country. And so I'd embrace it if I was a foreign company and, and, and try to make it a positive. Hmm. OK, this clock has been going from 2 minutes to 12 minutes to 9 minutes. So I have no idea how much time we have. But I do know it's time for audience questions. Okay, anybody have any questions for either one of us? Come on, nobody's got a question here, huh? Steve, I'm gonna put you on the spot, okay? That's a question that you have for Secretary Chertoff. Well, the-, the Oh, someone's got a question, right? <laughs> the Trump I, I question, I already, If already I had looked at you, I knew Jeff question. you'd have a question. Thank you. Hi, Jeff Toll with Intel. So in an earlier session, we were talking about artificial intelligence and big data. Okay, so, um, and one of the core uh, uh, issues of value propositions is access, data access, right? The better data sets you have, the better definitions of the data, the better realizations you get, right? So it seems like what you just articulated around uh, data sovereignty with kind of where we're going with this nationalism with the Trump administration, that seems to kind of put a big cap on that. It seems to kind of say, well, wait a minute, you know, we're going to fiercely protect, because when you hear the rhetoric, this is what I'm hearing as a, as a technologist. We're cutting things off. We're going to build stuff here. We're going to, we're going to enclose. But yet I look at, you know, the ramifications of GDPR. GDPR is really an enabler. It's saying, look, we need our markets to be open, but we just want to make sure it's done in a secure way with EU citizenry data, right? So what is that impact going to be? You've got one part of a global economy that's saying, let's open things up in a secure way, but we've got this very nationalistic closed door policy. How, how are, is, what's that going to mean economically? And in particular, with people like ourselves in the technology and security industry, what's that impact? Yeah, so um, uh, you're right. Access to data is is going to be important, and, and there's a there was a bill that was passed, and I should remember it because every time I meet with Senator Hatch, he always tells me that he passed it, and I can't remember what it's called now. Um, but <laughs> it's about data transfer between uh, EU and, yeah. and here, right? And you probably know what it's yeah. called, but um, but that I think that goes a long ways towards towards our ability to be able to. That, that nationalism stops kind of at job creation and, and data is, is still free flowing between um, between countries. So so I feel like we're, we're not we're not there yet. I think we still have free flow of data is available, uh, but I think it's going to take um, 
it's going to take a concerted effort on, uh, you know, from specific, you know, from legislatures to, to ensure that that doesn't happen. And I'm not, I'm not sure. I haven't seen anything from the Trump administration that that is is nationalistic at that level, at the data level, right? Uh, and, and and I don't know. No, no, it tends to be more a security issue than on the <clears throat> issue of data about American citizens. But but I agree with Steve. Um, I think of uh, th there be a solution in having a common set of standards about how it's managed. Now, one of the interesting challenges in this area is it means you really need to secure and, and manage rights at the data element level. It's not about network protection. So it's like digital rights management. And I think more and more what you're going to see is, and again, you know, as a tip for those looking for things to invest in, the ability to track and manage comprehensively individual data elements is, I think, going to be a huge opportunity in the future. Where you will, I think, see, you know, localization is China, um, you know, maybe Russia, although that's not that big a marketplace. Um, but um, I, I do think there's, there's a, a technology as well as a policy element to the solution. I think, um, just following up on that, you're talking about the cloud. It seems that, you know, as we move more and more things into the cloud, the two things that we still own, you own your identities and you own your payloads. So you better really make sure you're clear about that. And I think that's what Deb was talking about a little bit earlier. Um, okay, guys, how about, uh, you know, back to the security in the boardroom theme. Um, question, recommendations for board members. Three recommendations you would say, maybe Steve is a CEO, here's how you guys could help me more. And um, Michael, it, however you want to play it, you know, as a board chairman or as, you know, leading a firm, recommendations for board members. Uh, I think um, I think from my perspective as a CEO, um, if I were to ask my board, you know, what would what could you what how could you help me? It would be um, no more about it than I do. Uh, you have somebody in there that's that that's that's that can help me um, rather than you know just asking kind of random questions and and turn an email when we get to the security part of the board meeting, right? <laughs> and, and so I think, I think um, <coughs> having some expertise, having some domain knowledge in that space would, would, would be really, really important to me. Um, and then the second is um, focus, uh, focus on, um, focus on the, the long-term strategy part of it, right? The, 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 the you know, one of the challenges is in a board is 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 um, I go to a board. It's it's got a governance. It, it's for governance. It's for advice. It's for help, um, not necessarily for operational helping me operate uh, the secure. You know, the, our security strategy. But help me help me craft it, and help me you know get me in touch with. Um, if you don't know it, help me get me in touch with people that do. Um, our board was really part made the introduction to the Chertoff group. Um, because none of none of them really had any experience in, in security, and frankly hadn't cared for a long time, and, and so but so being able to connect me with the right people or having that expertise is probably the most important thing as a CEO I can see in that. And I would say you know as a, as a board chair, I mean I I heartily agree that you don't want to have the board micromanaging or conducting operations. Uh, you do want to make it clear that they put a priority on it and that they will invest to a reasonable degree in this. Um, and you do want to have accountability. And um, I think it's valuable in a way to get the CISO up to the board to, you know, to present, like in the boards I'm in, um, you know, you get a presentation, okay, what are we seeing over the last quarter in terms of nature of attacks, um, you know, reconnaissance, how many have managed to get into the network, before they were discovered, what are we seeing more generally in trends? Uh, you know, where we're in terms of maturity. Uh, just because I think actually it helps the the CISO um, because it gives them a sense that they're being taken seriously. Mm. It's also a good way to drive the CISO to make sure that that he's got a good story to, or she's got a good story to tell. I mean, one thing I remember when I was in in the DHS, so I met with President Bush every week on what's going on in the threat matrix. And the, the thing about that is, um, in anticipation of the meeting, everybody in the relevant departments, you know, intelligence community, DHS, uh, FBI, made sure that, you know, the word went out, we're gonna go and see the president, like, tomorrow, like, where are we with all these outstanding do-outs? 
And that really energized people to get stuff done. So you come in and say, OK, we've done x, y, z. This is where we are. As a management tool, having someone come in and report to the board you know, with metrics about what we've done is a good way of motive. Even if it goes over the board's head, it motivates the folks to know they got to do something. And I think that's helpful as well. Yeah, I would I would totally agree, and it gives it gives the CISO credibility in, across the organization when mm -hmm. you know when when they when they know that, that this person has to report up into the board. I, I would also say you know something that um, uh, Secretary Chertoff mentioned is make sure that you're investing as a board. You know, from my perspective, the only time I go to the board to talk about investments is if I were to if I were going to make a student body left sort of decision about where we're putting abandon a product line and, and it, I'd have that discussion with the board or if I wanted to um, go out of model right if, if we had yeah. a plan and I said I'm going to spend more than I thought I was I'm not going to deliver those things um, the reality is you don't you don't have to do that uh, as a CEO you know from, from my perspective this is a higher enough of priority that you ought to be able to prioritize this within your existing budgets and it, it's going to be more important than some of the things that you're doing in the organization. And that was the mistake I probably made early on, was I viewed this as, well, I'll have to go incrementally. I don't want to go fight that by, battle at the board, frankly, because it wasn't that important to me. But if it, it is an important enough investment that you ought to you know, go through a rigorous ZBB right. exercise right. and say, I don't need to do this. I, I'm going to fund it with, with, right. within my own budget. You don't have to go to the board That's right. uh, to justify that. And you shouldn't, I don't think, um, unless you've got to make a massive investment because you're so far behind the curve. But again, my experience is it doesn't take a, it doesn't take, you know, a gigantic investment to get you know, really good results in the organization pretty quickly. Uh, and you can do that on your own. You don't have to go go to the board. I think that is that. a great way to cap it. And that actually dovetails really good with some of the, the findings that we had from our study, which is in that blueprint, there's management led, there's board led. On the management led, you guys run the business, right? right? So if this is a priority, do it. I think where the board can help is one of the things you said earlier, which was it's about culture and people. Do we, is the CEO leading the charge? And are we sort of putting our money where our mouth is about uh, compensation plans, investments to reward the behavior that we're looking for. Um, I am pretty sure that we're out of time, so we can call it at this. Um, and before I sort of thank the panelists here or thank the, the guys, is um, I want to remind everybody that for lunch, if you can look at these little handy sheets on your table, um, we have these uh, birds of a feather. We pick the topics that we hope will be of interest to you. So grab food out there on the buffet line. Come on back in here. But uh, please join me, actually, before you split. So hold right there. Um, if you can uh, join me, a, a round of thanks for Steve and for Michael. Thank you. Thank you.